Jeffrey Gunlock got off the stage a little while ago. Uh, two interesting investment ideas. Uh, the first really playing into a theme that we talked about in your office. You had long XOP. Uh, right. An energy play, and you told me back in what December that December you 13. that you said go long commodities. This plays into that, right? It does play into that. That was really my uh, going to be the th the crux of my presentation. Uh, basically, what I've been talking about is that there are many indicators that signal inflation. Uh, that's a change. For years, there weren't really inflation indicators. What I talked about on the stage here was things that are leading for the core CPI, like GDP, real GDP, like. Uh, PMI surveys, and they lead with a pretty high correlation of 0.8, and they do it with about a year and a half to, to, to uh, year and three quarter lead time, and they turned up exactly a year and a half, year and three quarter ago. And so also, historically, when you go into late economic cycle, and particularly when you start getting closer to a recession, what a lot of people don't understand is commodities actually go up a lot every time, going back to 1972. So also the energy sector, and I've heard this a lot on CNBC because it's a, it's a valid point, is it's lagged in a way that's kind of bizarre this year. Uh, you know, it's not, not a very great performing sector, and yet oil has gone up towards $70 a barrel on West mm -hmm. Texas Intermediate. And if you look historically at the performance of the energy sector versus the S&P 500, not surprisingly, it tends to be correlated with the movements in oil. But that hasn't happened this time, and I think there's some catch-up that can happen there. So I think it's fairly compelling. The charts look really good, too, on the XOP, the, uh, the uh, exploration production part of the energy sector. The only problem with that idea, I think, is maybe we go into a recession, and we might get a gain in that sector going into that, but once the recession comes, it's almost certain to go down. So I was a little reluctant to just have something that was so economically dependent. I mean, you think we could potentially be in a recession that soon that would it upset that kind of investment idea? Uh, I think we could. These SOAN uh, recommendations are arbitrarily judged on one-year horizons, right. which is pretty strange. I mean, the pick I did last year was up like 35% like three months ago, and I was up 13. But so uh, you know, I get tagged with up 13, which isn't bad. But yeah, I think I think the, there's no sign of recession now. So visibility is maybe six months on recessions. But I do think we could see one potentially in the first quarter of next year. I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying it's not, it wouldn't be that unlikely, given the length of this economic cycle, right. given that interest rates have been rising, given that the stock market is wobbling compared to where it was in the fourth quarter of last year. I mean, these things are giving us things to think about. You don't think that the new tax law has expanded the cycle, or extended it? Uh, I think that's pretty much priced into people's thinking, that, that narrative on the, on the tax situation. Uh, so it, it probably does extend it. That's probably why we are now challenging the longest expansion in the post-war era. Oh, in other words, things might have maybe moved it's up. already happened. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Some of those things. What do you make of um, you know? You, you talk about recession. People look at the and I obviously want to talk about rates with you, but not necessarily just energy. Yeah. Uh, the 210, 210 spread. People look at that and they say, "What's up with that? Is that telling us something we need to be worried about?" N not yet. Although uh, it was getting a little skinny a, couple, a week or so ago when it got down about 42 basis points. 50 is a level that's once it gets breached, it does start to give pause because historically when you go through 50 basis points on twos, tens, you generally at some point go to zero. You go flat. It's pretty unusual. You don't go to 50 and then go back into a steepening cycle typically. Now this, there's a lot of caveats in this cycle. There's been so much manipulation with quantitative easing and negative interest rates overseas and the like, it's possible that past uh, behavior won't exactly be prologue for what's happening. So for example, in Japan, they had very, very low interest rates, still do for a long time. They had se sequential recessions without, a flat, without an inverted curve. Mm -hmm. Maybe it has something to do with rates being so low, that when rates are very, very low, will the curve really invert at all? Because I can see why if the 10-year yields eight, and, and the two-year yields 850, I can see why people would still buy the 10-year. You're getting eight, which satisfies a lot of investment needs. But when the 10-year is 275, which it was, and the two-year is down at 225, I don't really think it's that exciting to pick up 50 basis points to take that amount of rate risk. So maybe the curve won't invert this time. But it is telling us certainly that, uh, you, you know, that there's something to start looking at for recession warning. What do you make of the 10 year in and of itself? I mean, here we are knocking on the door about to bust it down at three. Yeah, we got then to what 2. happens. 2.994. Well, I've been of the opinion that closing above three would lead to an acceleration to higher yields. 
and we have not closed above three. And the other big level, I think it's even bigger, is 322 on the third year, which we did close at. That was the high close this year, and then we backed off pretty nicely. But now we're back up 316, 317. We're getting close again. So I think breaking above three will yeah, be the same right as now breaking screen. above 322 on the third year. But what's interesting is the most recent rate rise off of 272 up to 299 this morning, it's hard for people to come up with why it's happening. And uh, it, it's like the bond market is kind of chronically weak in recent days. And I, I'm reminded of the old adage that you need buying to move prices up, but prices can fall of their own weight. And I think it has something to do with all this bond supply and these deficits that I've been talking about now for about 18 months. It's now here in real time. I mean, we're borrowing like 100 billion a month, you know, and mm -hmm. that's kind of a lot. And, and uh, so uh, I, I think that there's a lot of negative positioning against the bond market. So you would think that maybe it'd be stubborn to go to higher yields, but prices can fall of their own weight. It looks to me like the shorts have not covered. Do you worry at all about the Fed making a policy mistake? Of course, of course. The Fed is, is back into a variant of their old school mode where 10, 12 years ago they were hiking at every meeting. And they do it until something breaks. Now they're doing it once a quarter, but they'll so they seem inclined to do it until something bad happens. And don't forget, they're doing it at the same time that we're ramping up quantitative tightening. So we have this double-barreled Fed thing, and I think that uh, that is something to be worried about. Uh, the Fed has gone from a mode of, we will raise rates when the data gets better, to a mode of, we will raise rates unless the data gets worse. And so that puts them into that kind of semi-autopilot mode, which in the past has led to problems, and, and certainly, the 210 spread that we talked about a moment ago, that certainly isn't giving a warm and fuzzy feeling about what the Fed is doing. It might not be on the cusp of a big mistake yet, but it's not acting in a way that I think the Fed would find you know, reassuring. Let me lastly ask you about the other investment idea you had, short Facebook. Right. Really? Yeah, really. Where did that come from? Well, I, I came, it came from, A, I was long the energy thing, and I didn't want to be recession, full-on recession exposed in my pick. And I, so I wanted something to short against it, and I saw the uh, congressional testimony, which I thought was terrible. I thought it was dismissive. I thought it was insincere. By I thought, Zuckerberg? Yeah. I, I thought that uh, he was uh, very semantic in the way he was answering questions as opposed to fulsome. And I, when the charts I used on stage today, once the regulators show up, they tend to cause problems. There's basically two modes of regulation by Congress, none and overreaching. And I think we've moved from none, and we're about to move into overreaching. And I used a slide that when they started to talk about uh, regulating biotech companies, for example, the stocks just started tanking. And uh, Facebook has dropped. It hasn't tanked. I'm actually happy about that because it leads to a better position for this recommendation. But I'm reminded, I used the, the metaphor of the San Francisco earthquake in the stock market. The day after the San Francisco earthquake, the legendary investor Jesse Livermore short, shorted the market because he couldn't believe that the market was actually unchanged. And he said, this is a big event and it hasn't been digested into the bullish psychology of the market. I think the regulation here is a big event and I also think that there's never one cockroach in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So we've had this apology tour, we've seen it before, this isn't the first apology tour. I think we've, we're already one apology too far on this thing. One more problem, and there's going to be one because there's never one cockroach. I just don't know what, what will happen with the credibility of these, I'm sorry, we're gonna make it better type of statements. And I don't find it reassuring that one of his answers was AI is gonna solve our problems five or 10 years from now. This problem began yesterday, not five or 10 years from now. And so I, I think that there's a lot of, I think there's gonna be a lot of turbulence in the air for this flight. All right, we will uh, we'll see how the plane uh, gets through it and see if it lands well. We'll see. Jeffrey, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate Good it very much. Jeffrey Gunlock is the founder, uh, CEO of Double Line. Guys, back to you. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.